All right, guys, I want to welcome you to the week seven AP Bio content review session. Uh, we are starting at 10. Please mute your microphone and turn off your webcam. That just makes uh, Google Meet work better. Uh, feel free to unmute if you have any questions. We are recording today's session, and that recording is going to be posted on the A-plus College Ready Science YouTube channel. Hope you can join us next week for our week eight session. It will be at 10 a.m. on Thursday, October 15th and it's going to cover cellular respiration. All right, today's topics are going to be uh, enzymes, metabolic pathways, and feedback inhibition. Enzymes, as I hope you already know, are biological catalyst. That means they help to make things happen. In this case, they help to make um, chemical reactions in your body get started. They increase the rate of these chemical reactions without actually taking part in the reaction. So enzymes don't get used up. They're used over and over again. They help to start the reaction, but aren't affected by it. The main thing that they do is they decrease the activation energy of a reaction. That means that they let reactions happen or they help reactions to happen uh, without needing as much energy to get started. Enzymes are three-dimensional proteins which means that they're coded for by DNA. Uh, very, um, most genetic disorders are enzyme problems. Um, they happen because the, the DNA that codes for a particular protein mutates, and therefore the protein is shaped wrong, and therefore the enzyme that that protein is part of does not work correctly. Shape is important to function. The shape of an enzyme makes it really, really specific. Each enzyme only catalyzes one very specific reaction. And that means you have thousands of different enzymes in your body. It's really important to maintain the shape of the enzyme because it determines its function. That shape is maintained mostly uh, by hydrogen bonds and also by disulfide bonds between uh, cysteine amino acids that are contained within the, uh, the protein or the amino acid or the, um, the enzyme. There's some terminology that you need to be aware of when we're dealing with enzymes. One of those terms is the substrate. The substrate is the substance or substances that an enzyme acts on. It might be a substance that um, is broken down by an enzyme. For example, lactase is an enzyme. We know it's an enzyme because its name ends in A-S-E. And the substrate for that enzyme is lactose, a sugar. So lactose is the substrate. It's broken down. The, the, uh, the, the reaction that breaks it down is catalyzed by the enzyme lactase. The active site is the site on the enzyme where the substrate actually binds. So they actually fit together. Let's look at a picture of that. So here's an enzyme. And this little groove that we see right in here. That's the active site. And notice that only materials with very specific shapes like this one will fit in. The shape of the substrate and the shape of the active site we say have to be complementary. That means they, they fit together. And lot, lots of times we say that they fit together sort of like a, a key fits into a lock. And that makes the enzyme very specific so that it really is only going to interact with this substrate. Both the shape of the substrate and the charges of the substrate and the active site or the enzyme have to be complementary. We'll come back to this picture in a second. We already talked about how the enzyme and the substrate fit together, sort of like a lock and a key. The shape is hugely important. But as I already said a second ago, the charges at the active site and the charges of the substrate also have to match up. Here we see what an, the effect an enzyme has on activation energy. So this is the amount of free energy contained within the, the reactants. This amount of energy is the amount of energy needed to get a reaction started. This is the activation energy. 
And notice that what happens in this case, once the reaction gets started, there's now less energy in the products than there was in the reactants. That means that this particular reaction that's being catalyzed is exothermic or exergonic. It's releasing energy, probably as heat releases it out to the environment. Same thing over here. This is the same reaction. This is the reaction without an enzyme. So without an enzyme, this reaction can happen. This activation energy is probably supplied as maybe, um, could be ATP, could be a lot of heat, uh, but it takes quite a bit of activation energy to get that reaction going. This is a, a diagram of the same exact reaction. This time though, there's an enzyme present. And notice that the amount of activation energy is a fraction here of what it was there. The reactant still started with the same amount of free energy. The products still ended with the same amount of energy. The difference was it took less energy to get the reaction started. And that's the beauty of enzymes. That's what they do. Enzymes lower activation energy. So here's a quick question. Is the reaction illustrated in the graph endothermic or exothermic and explain why? So here's the amount of energy that the reactants start with. Here's the amount of energy that the products end up with. Notice that the products end up with more energy than the reactants do. That should tell you that this reaction is endothermic. Energy is being taken in. It's, um, the reactants are taking in energy and storing it in the bonds of the products. So that looks like our right answer there. It's endothermic. It's absorbing energy. The products have more energy than the reactants. And that energy is coming from outside, either from ATP, or from heat in the environment. So let's go back to this diagram for a second. So we start with an enzyme and a substrate. Their complementary shapes and charges allow them to bind together at the active site. When they're together, we call that the enzyme substrate complex. And this is where that enzyme is going to actually catalyze the reaction. Maybe it pulls those products apart, like you see here. Uh, maybe it um, changes shape a little bit and pushes two different reactants together. Either way, when they're together, the enzyme substrate, we get what's called a, um, a conformational change, or sometimes it's called an induced fit. So that's when the enzyme slightly changes shape, just tiny, tiny changes in shape that catalyze a reaction, either putting reactants together or putting enough torque on the bonds to break them apart. Notice that when the reaction's over, the enzyme is unchanged. Looks exactly like it did when the reaction started. And that enzyme can be used over and over again to catalyze the same reaction. We get products, products that are different than the substrate that we started with. So in uh, reaction A, that's a degradation reaction. It's a breakdown reaction. But enzymes also can catalyze reactions that are synthetic or, or synthesis type reactions. So here we have two substrates. Those both fit into the active side of the enzyme. Here the enzyme, when it goes through its induced fit, it's gonna bend in slightly, push those two substrates together, make a bind, and we end up with a product. We end up again with an enzyme that's unchanged and can be used to catalyze that same reaction over and over and over. Key, key idea to get from this diagram is that we think about enzymes doing breakdown reactions, but realize they also can do anabolic or synthesis type reactions as well. So we talked a second ago about enzymes lowering activation energy. They can do that one in one of several ways. One of them is that they can simply help to line up the substrates so that when they collide, they collide with the proper orientation. For reactions to happen in the body, for reactions to happen anywhere really, the chemicals that are reacting have to collide with each other. Most of the time those collisions are random and it may take a while for the, the reactants to collide with the proper orientation to react. 
But since substrates can only fit into an enzyme in a particular way, the enzymes line those substrates up so that they collide with the proper orientation the first time and the reaction can happen easily. Sometimes we, uh, enzymes put physical stress on bonds. So like we said before, the enzyme can slightly change shape the whole induced fit idea. And when it does that, it can bend and twist a little bit and put forces on the bonds that cause them to break. And then another thing enzymes can do is they can change substrate reactivity. Um, they can add electrons to or take electrons away from a substrate. They could add phosphate groups or take away phosphate groups um, from a substrate. And that can change the, the energy content and therefore the reactivity of that substrate. So here's another important question. We oftentimes with enzymes on the AP exam see graph questions. And the graph that you're typically going to see with um, an enzyme related question is going to have a similar shape to this graph. Notice that we're looking at the moles of product formed against time. And we're assuming there's an enzyme with some reactants. Um, and we almost always get this little, almost like half of a parabola curve. Let's think about why we get this curve. So to begin with, in these first few sections of the graph, the reaction is being catalyzed and it's being catalyzed quickly. We have a pretty steep slope there. And remember that slope helps to show us the rate of a reaction. Steeper, steeper slope means higher rate. So here we have a pretty steep slope. The reactions are happening pretty quick. And that's because there's lots of um, there's lots of substrates in the beginning, and those substrates easily find the enzymes. The reactions happen very fa very fast. But as time progresses, those substrates are being converted into products. So there's less and less of them. The concentration of substrates drop over time. There's less reactants. Therefore, it's harder for the substrates and the enzymes to collide. So as time progresses the rate decreases. And we see that in the graph because the slope is becoming less and less and less and less until up here, the slope is zero, which means the reaction is not happening anymore. And it's not happening anymore because there are no more substrates. The enzymes are still there. Remember, they're not used up, but the substrates are gone and therefore there's no more reaction. So let's look at the answer for this question. During which time interval is the rate of the reaction the greatest? This is the kind of question they like to ask on AP exams, and it's always going to be at the beginning. And it's at the beginning because that's when there's the most substrates. That's when the rate is going to be the highest because it's easier for the substrates and the enzymes to get together and catalyze that reaction. So if you're ever asked this question, the rate's always going to be highest at the beginning because across time, substrate concentration reactant concentration drops and therefore the rate of the reaction decreases. Here we're asked to find the rate of the reaction between T equals 20 and T equals 10 and 20. Remember rate equals slope. And remember that slope is change in Y over change in X. So let's find our coordinates for our two points. So at T equals 20, that's x equals 20. Our y coordinate is maybe 14. And at t equals 10, our y coordinate, let's say, is 7. So let's find a slope. So we're going to go change in y over change in x. So let's take our two y's, 14 and 7. 14 minus 7, that's a change in y, over change in x, 10. 20 minus 10. So we end up with 7 over 10 or about 0.7. And the units would be the y units, moles, over the x units, seconds. So 0.7 moles per second looks good. So when you're asked to find the rate, find the slope, do that by going change in y over change in x. So I think we've talked about most of this already. We know the substrate is the material acted on by the enzyme. 
the enzyme and the active site, the enzyme and the substrate bind together at a point on the enzyme called the active site. They fit together almost like a lock and a key. Their shapes have to be complementary. When they do get together, though, that induced fit or conformational change occurs. And that's when the enzyme slightly changes shape to catalyze the reaction, either to break apart the substrate or to push together and cause different substrates to bind. The conformational change or induced fit improves the fit between the active site and the substrate and helps to catalyze the reaction. This statement really applies to enzymes. Complementarity leads to a high degree of specificity. Sounds really smart, sounds really complicated, but essentially it means because the shape of the active site and the substrate are complementary, each enzyme can only catalyze a very specific reaction. Each enzyme is really only good for one use, one, one uh, type of reaction. It can do that same reaction over and over again, but it's only good for that one kind of reaction. We see that here. Most enzymes in your body are found in only certain places. You wouldn't want digestive enzymes, for example, in your, um, in your hand. You want those in your stomach or maybe in your intestines. And they're found there so that um, different parts of your body take on very specific functions. So a couple of enzyme, other enzyme related terms that we need to be aware of. There are these things called activators. And these are substances that actually bind to an enzyme. Sometimes they can be minerals. Sometimes they can be organic compounds like vitamins, for example. If they're minerals, we call the activators cofactors. And these bind to um, an enzyme, slightly change its shape, and essentially turn on that enzyme. They make it active. If the materials are organic, vitamins, for example, we call them coenzymes. Either way, they bind to the enzyme. Both of these things bind at a place that's not the active site. And when they do, they activate the enzyme. They turn it on. This is why certain mineral deficiencies and vitamin deficiencies are very, very bad for your body. Because when you don't have those vitamins and minerals, certain enzymes in your body don't function. And because they don't function, there are certain reactions that your body needs to do that it can't. At least it can't with a low amount of energy. And that can cause serious, serious issues throughout your body. Another thing we want to talk about is um, the effect of temperature on enzyme activity. And to do that, we're gonna look at a graph. So here we have rate of reaction graphed against temperature. Now you would think at first, if the higher the temperature, the faster the reaction ought to be because temperature speeds up molecular motion and for reactions to happen, molecules have to collide. So the faster they're moving, the more they ought to collide, the more they ought to react. You would think that. And we do see that in the beginning of our graph. Higher temperatures cause faster reaction rates. But then we get up to this maximum point. And we're going to call this temperature, which is around 37 or so. That's, by the way, that's body temperature, human body temperature in Celsius. That's what we call the optimum or optimal temperature. And that's where the reaction rate happens the fastest at. But notice if we go past that and we continue to increase the temperature, that the rate of the reaction drops. And that happens because enzymes are proteins and proteins are held together by things like hydrogen bonds. And when the temperature gets too hot, those hydrogen bonds start to break and the protein and therefore the enzymes start to change shape. Here we're talking about major changes in shape. That process is called denaturation. And when enzymes denature, they don't work. So if we go past the optimum temperature, the rate of an enzyme catalyzed reaction is going to decrease because the enzyme is essentially starting to fall apart. It's starting to denature. pH has a similar effect on enzymes. Most enzymes in your body have an optimum temperature that might look something like, or an optimum pH that might look something like this where the optimum pH is around seven. If you decrease the pH, 
or increase the pH in either direction, notice the rate of the reaction drops. And that's because pH also affects the structure of the enzyme. And if the pH is too low or too high, the enzyme begins to fall apart. It begins to denature. Here we see that pepsin has an optimum pH of around two. And that's because this, this, this enzyme is found mostly in the stomach where the pH is too. So this enzyme is, uh, is adapted to those conditions. In this case, if the pH gets lower than two or higher than two, the rate of the reaction decreases a little bit. Trypsin, on the other hand, is found in the small intestine where the pH is around eight-ish. So if the pH gets higher than that, the rate decreases. If the pH gets lower than eight, notice the, the rate decreases. But for most enzymes in your body, the optimum pH is around seven because that's the pH of your body fluids and your blood. All right, there are also these structures called inhibitors or these chemicals called inhibitors. We know inhibit means to stop. So inhibitors are substances that bind to enzymes and stop them from working correctly. Some of them bind to the active site and therefore they block the, the substrate from binding there and they prevent the reaction from occurring. These kinds of inhibitors are called competitive inhibitors. Again, they bind to the active site, they block the substrate from binding there and therefore they stop, um, stop reactions from happening. There are certain drugs called sulfa drugs that work this way. These drugs are used sometimes in place of antibiotics. Um, there's a really important vitamin called folic acid. It's important for humans. It's also important for bacteria. We humans get it from our diet. We don't have enzymes to make it. We have to eat it. And we get it from citrus, um, citrus fruits mostly. Bacteria, on the other hand, have enzymes that take a fairly common substance, PABA, and convert that PABA into folic acid. Sulfa drugs, we now know, block this enzyme. They inhibit it so that um, bacteria can't convert PABA to folic acid. Bacteria don't normally get folic acid from their diet, and when they don't have folic acid, they die. So by blocking the production of folic acid, sulfa drugs help to kill off bacteria. They do that by binding to the active site of the enzyme that converts PABA to, to folic acid. Sulfa drugs don't affect us in a bad way because we don't have that enzyme. On the other hand, there are also non-competitive inhibitors. These are substances that bind to an enzyme at a, at a location other than the active site. It might be where the um, cofactor or coenzyme normally binds. It might be just another random spot. Regardless though, when they bind to that enzyme, they deactivate it. Penicillin, for example, is a non-competitive inhibitor for um, for enzymes that help bacteria build cell walls. Heavy metals, here we're talking about things like lead and mercury. Why they're so dangerous is they bind to certain enzymes and cause them not to work. Lots of poisons do the same thing, like arsenic, for example, cyanide. They, they kill us by causing certain enzymes that are um, necessary for life not to be able to work. They non-competitively inhibit those enzymes and therefore certain reactions that we have to do can't happen. All right, let's switch gears for a minute and talk about um, what are called metabolic pathways. So there are lots of metabolic pathways in your body. This term is gonna show up on every AP exam. Metabolic pathways are linked series of chemical reactions that occur within a cell. So most things that happen in your body are complicated and they can't happen in just one reaction. They have to happen in a series of reactions. Um, and almost always the product of one step is the reactant for the next step in the metabolic pathway. Here's some examples of metabolic pathways in your body. Krebs cycle, which happens in cell respiration. The Calvin cycle, which is the part of photosynthesis that actually manufactures the sugar. Photosynthetic, photosynthesis itself could be thought of as a metabolic pathway. Digestion could be thought of as a metabolic pathway. All of aerobic cell respiration could be thought of as metabolic pathways. So complicated series of chemical reactions in which the product of one step is the reactant for the next. 
typically in a metabolic pathway, we start with some substrate or some reactant, we end up with some product. But like we said before, it takes lots of steps. Uh, and let's just look at a diagram here. For example, here is, um, here's the Krebs cycle. So the initial substrate for the Krebs cycle is this material called acetyl-CoA. In step one, that acetyl-CoA is used to make citrate. Step two, it's converted to isocitrate. Step three, uh, or step four, converted to ketoglutarate. All these steps, all these products that are made in between the first step and the final step, those are called intermediates. They're not what the cell's trying to make, but the cell has to make those to get to the final end product. So the metabolic intermediates. Notice here's the Calvin cycle. Starts with carbon dioxide. And we get several steps along the way, but the product that the cell is trying to make is this stuff called G3P or glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, which is essentially half of a glucose molecule. Um, and the, the, the cell will put together two of those to make glucose for the cell. Every reaction that happens in a, in a metabolic pathway requires a different enzyme, which means each step needs at least one different enzyme to make it happen. The amazing thing is that many of these metabolic pathways have the same reactions and the same enzymes in all life from bacteria to plants to fungi to humans. Cell respiration works exactly the same way in all of life. Digestion works very similar in lots of different kinds of life. All these shared metabolic pathways are evidence of shared ancestry or common ancestry, that all of life evolved from some kind of common ancestor. All right, we also wanna talk briefly about feedback inhibition. So here's the definition. It's the temporary deactivation of an enzyme brought about by an elevation of an end product of the pathway. Now that sounds kind of complicated, but let's look at a diagram and think about what's going on. So here's a metabolic pathway. And what the cell is trying to make is substance F. This metabolic pathway starts with reactant A and is designed to make F. Here's the thing though. Eventually, the cell has enough of F. It doesn't need to keep making it all the time. It should make enough and then stop making it until some of it's used up. And when it gets low on F, it should start back the process of making more. This is a way that your body conserves its resources. Feedback inhibition is all about con conserving um, substrates conserving energy. So notice that each step, the arrows represent steps, the, the E's represent the enzymes that catalyze each step. So substance A is um, the substrate for enzyme number one, and enzyme number one catalyzes the reaction that converts it to a different substance, substance B. Substance B is the substrate for enzyme two. Enzyme two catalyzes a reaction that converts it to C. C is the substrate for enzyme three. Enzyme three catalyzes a reaction that converts it to substance D. D is the substrate for enzyme four, catalyzes a reaction, converts it to substance E. And substance E is a substrate for enzyme five, which converts it into substance F, which is our product, what we're looking for. So this reaction starts up, the whole metabolic pathway happens, and we start making product F. But as the concentration, and this is all about concentration, as the concentration of product F gets high in the cell, some of that product F ends up bumping into the, a, a site. Usually it's on the first enzyme in the pathway, usually on enzyme one, called the allosteric site, or you'll sometimes hear it called the feedback site. And the shape of that feedback or allosteric site is complementary to the shape of the end product of the whole pathway. When that end product binds to that feedback or allosteric site, that changes the shape of the active site of this enzyme. 
and therefore this first reactant won't fit into it anymore. Well, that means that this step can't happen. Well, if this step can't happen, that means substance B is never made, which means there's no substrate for enzyme two, which means this step doesn't happen. Well, that means substance C is never made, which means there's no substrate for enzyme three, which means this step doesn't happen, which means this step doesn't happen, which means this step doesn't happen, which means end product F is no longer made. And that turns out to be a good thing because if there's already a high concentration of F in the cell, the cell doesn't need to make any more right now. So this is a way to turn off a pathway when the concentration of the product of that pathway is already high within the cell. Now here's what ends up happening. As the concentration drops, the, 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 the molecule or the, the portion of substance F that's binding to this allosteric or feedback site is eventually used up. When that leaves the allosteric or feedback site, this active site goes back to its normal shape, which means now A can bind to it, which means enzyme one can work, substance B is produced, which means substance C can be produced, which means substance D can be produced, E can be produced, and F can be produced. So think of feedback inhibition as a way to turn off a pathway when there's enough, when the concentration of the product of that pathway is high. When the concentration of that product gets low, the switch is flipped back on and the pathway starts back up. So it's beautifully designed. It's a way for your body to conserve its resources and energy and essentially not make something that you already have plenty of. All right, we're going to end today by looking at this FRQ. So the effect of P effects of pH and temperature were studied for an enzyme catalyzed reaction. The following results were obtained. So here we see the same kind of graph that we saw before, where at first, when you increase temperature, the activity of the enzyme goes up and it goes up to some magic temperature that we're going to call the optimum temperature. In human body, that's almost always 37 degrees Celsius or 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. And then if the temperature goes up past that, the enzyme starts to break apart and the enzyme activity decreases, mostly because of denaturation, the changing of the shape of the, of the enzyme. Effects of pH look very similar. Um, increasing pH increases activity up to the optimum of pH, which for most enzymes in your body is around seven-ish usually. And then if the pH is increased further than that, enzyme activity decreases. And again, that's because that enzyme works best at seven. And if you increase or decrease the temperature away from seven, the enzyme starts to denature. It starts to change shape, fall apart, and not work. So let's address the question. How do temperature and pH affect the activity of this enzyme? In your answer, include a discussion of the relationship between the structure and function of the enzyme as well as a discussion of how structure and function of enzymes are, I should say, affected by temperature and pH. So I would say that increasing temperature up to an optimum temperature, which is usually around 37 in humans, increases enzyme activity. And that's because increasing temperature increases molecular motion and um, increases the odds that the substrates and the, the enzymes are going to collide and react. If temperatures are increased past that optimum temperature of 37, um, the, the hydrogen bonds that hold together the structure of the enzyme start to break, the enzyme changes shape, it denatures, and therefore the enzyme activity or the rate of the reactions decrease. So that's kind of how I would answer A. As far as B goes, or the, the second part of A, the pH part, um, enzymes work best at a certain optimum pH, usually around seven for humans. And if the pH is increased or decreased away from seven in either direction, higher or lower pH, the um, 
the proteins that make up the enzyme begin to denature and therefore the enzyme activity decreases. Now, part B wants us to describe a controlled experiment that could have produced data shown for either temperature or pH. So it says, uh, be sure to state a hypothesis um, that was tested here. So I'm going to say that temperatures can have an effect on the rate of an enzyme catalyzed reaction. That's going to be my hypothesis. It's a controlled experiment, which means we need a control group and we need experimental groups. So I might say, let's start with a, um, let's start at a temperature of zero. And let's make that be our control. Actually, it might be better to start with, um, if we already know what's going to happen here, it might be better to start at 37 and that might be our control. And we can make, mix together enzymes and substrates and measure the rate of product formation or the rate of enzyme activity. And then we could take the same setup, mix together enzymes and substrates, but have them at different temperatures, maybe have a zero, Maybe you have a 5, a 10, a 15, a 20, 25, 30, 35, a 40, 45, 50, and so on. And measure the enzyme activity at each of those different, uh, different temperatures. Stressing that the only difference between each of these treatments is the temperature. We're going to use the same enzymes, the same substrates, uh, the same amount of water, the same containers. Everything's going to be the same between all of these treatment groups, except the temperature. We might also want to mention that we're going to do uh, several trials for each temperature. We're going to replicate. We're going to use um, a good sample size. All right, that's it for week seven AP Bio content review. Remember next week's session, week eight session is going to cover cell respiration and it'll be held on next Thursday at 10 o'clock. Hope to see you there.